My name is Vincent Huang, and I'll be the leading moderator today. As you have no doubt heard, the topic of the webinar today is mobilizing the community. So this is for everyone now armed with both the knowledge and passion to be civically engaged, to go out and claim their stake in the political arena. I just want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you are uncomfortable with that for any reason, you can feel free to leave. Additionally, this webinar is a safe space for everyone without exception. So if you had any plans to be hateful for any reason, then please leave or we will remove you should it become necessary. So before we start, I would like to give a shout out to National Civic Leadership Forum or the NCLF, which is providing resources on civic leadership and trainings this week in an online format. You can find more of the presentations on Hoover by exploring the platform. I'd also like to quickly thank Civic Leadership USA or CL USA uh, for being our sponsor. They are a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to engaging and empowering uh, our community leaders. I'd also like to thank the YLFA team for their support because a lot of this could not have happened without their help. So for our first block today, uh, our time is reserved for a speech and a question and answer session from a keynote speaker. And afterwards, we will separate into breakout rooms with the panelists. And while some of our speakers today have worked with various political parties, I just want to note that they have come here today not to represent their views or their political stances, but in the interest of discussing the importance of community mobilization, which is crucial to democracy, regardless of which side you find yourself on. Oh, sorry, I have it here. Uh, and so, uh, for first section, our keynote speaker is California Assembly member Evan Lowe, who will undoubtedly have valuable things to say about his experience in mobilizing his community. For a little background, Assembly member Lowe was California's youngest elected openly gay and Asian American mayor, the co-chair of Andrew Yang's 2020 presidential bid, and is currently representing California's 28th district as a state assembly member. At the end of his presentation, he'll be answering questions from the audience submitted through our registration link. But if you have any questions you'd like, you'd like for him to answer, uh, please throw it in the chat box. So without further ado, please welcome assembly member Evan Lowe. Vincent, how are you? Good to see good, you Good, all. how are you? You me okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, it's good to see all of you here. Uh, uh, hello and greetings. Hopefully you all are staying safe. But uh, my name is a California Assembly member, Evan Lowe. And as you can see, uh, we are here to gather to talk about the importance of civic engagement and encouraging as much participation as possible. And how we do that is uh, with all of your work to be able to say, what is the voice of the Asian Pacific Islanders? And how do we ensure that we are part of a multicultural society and also ensure that we have a stake in the work that we see for the policy priorities that we have. Uh, but it comes about that when you think about that of Asia Pacific Islanders, we all think about the typical things that we think about, or at least in the political realm, we think about the traditional sectors to which we've all said, like my father told me, who is an optometrist, said you should become a doctor like me, and, or become an engineer, or uh, become an accountant, something safe, become a lawyer. Uh, that The definition of success is to make money and to provide for your families. Whereas you can see today, where do we see Asian Pacific Islanders within the realms of civic engagement on Black Lives Matter? Where do we see Asian Pacific Islanders with respect to environmental justice? Where do we see Asian Pacific Islanders on representation, ensuring that we have health care for all? or the access to educational opportunities that previous generations had before us. And that is, I think, our obligation, which is to say, especially in this election year, what do we hope and what do we encourage our communities to ensure that we see the type of rhetoric and dynamic of representing our community effectively and well? But then it leads us to ask that question. If you think about other communities, uh, what are the priorities for the women's movement to be able to say that those should be able to choose for themselves or that of Black Lives Matter and public safety and criminal justice reform or whether or not it is that of the LGBTQ community and ensuring equality across the board. Therein lies the question for all of us to ask, answer for our communities. What is it that the Asian Pacific Islander community demands? What do we hope for? 
what are our aspirations, especially within the society as a whole. Uh, but growing up, I, I did not want to do politics. I now am a politician in the state legislature, representing close to half a million people in the California state uh, legislature. But it wasn't always the case in which uh, growing up, I too just thought that I was gonna become a doctor or a lawyer like my parents and my grandparents had talked to me about. But as a fourth generation Chinese American, I also realized very quickly that we had a role to play in our society. So I think, and I hope that we think about encouraging, utilizing the structures in place so that when we see someone like an Andrew Yang, and we see someone who looks like us with a deep sense of pride on the presidential stage, who can speak to these issues that has an impact, that these issues and these policies have a tremendous impact on the importance of not only the future for us as Asian Pacific Islanders, but for everyone. And that's when we think about the issues like universal basic income or housing affordability. These are not just issues that impact the Asian Pacific Islander community, but impact us all. So I encourage us all to think about this, to answer the call to service and to think about the roles that we equally play. Finally, let me just say this, uh, that hopefully you can also see in the background, we have an opportunity uh, with Proposition 18 to allow young people to vote, 18 year olds to vote in primary elections. And again, this is about empowering young people. This is about civic engagement. And Vincent, I'm hopeful that we can continue to think about how we as Asian Pacific Islanders can encourage our communities to participate. Because when we look at voter participation amongst the Asian Pacific Islander community, not only in the state of California, but in the nation, it's pretty low, it's pretty abysmal commensurate with that of the demographic population. So we still have a long way to go to making sure that our people get out and vote and encouraging young people to do so. So I'm excited by all of you. I hope you'll join on the conversation about encouraging us all to participate in this process and looking forward to the continued conversation so that we can see more female Asia Pacific Islanders in particular joining us in the California state legislature and in local boards and and city councils and as mayors throughout the entire state. Thank you, Seven Member Lowe, for the amazing presentation. I hope everyone else in our audience uh, learned something valuable today uh, from that. And I, I too, I, I think that it's definitely a, a an, an issue among us young Asians that we aren't participating enough uh, in politics. Like you said, we. We spend too much time thinking, oh, we want to go into STEM fields, but not thinking as much about, oh, uh, what can we do for a community? What can we do for everyone else we see around, not just go out there to, to, to make money? Uh, so the first question I'd like to ask you today is uh, more for us generally. So like you said, we want, we want us to go out there and vote, but what else can we do as individuals to mobilize a community? Like, yeah, we can, uh, we can run for office, but what's the most accessible thing you, you think we can do as young people, as older people, what can we do to help participate? Well, I think it's important to be incorporated into the fabric of society and the institutions that exist. And if we think about whether it be a national or statewide organization that represents us within various fields, that's really important. And so whether or not you desire to still become in the healthcare sector in the space, but be active, for example, then in the California Medical Association, and join the board of directors and become a leader within that organization, or whether or not you want to be within the lawyers uh, or the legal field in the lawyers association or whatever the other institutions might be. There are many things that we can individually do. We don't all need to run for office and become politicians, but there are ways to which we can participate and be involved and to exercise our right. And especially right now, the census is critical to making sure that we are all counted because that'll be very important for us to get the type of public resources commensurate with that of our demographic population. And in many places throughout the state of California and uh, throughout the nation, there are major sectors and areas to which Asian Pacific Islanders are the majority populations. And so it matters then when you see the police chiefs re representing and reflecting the community. And there is a unique distinction there. Does it matter to have a dean a president of university, a chancellor who is from our community, understanding the issues that are so important to us. So there are many ways to participate and be involved. 
Yeah. So if I, if I understand correctly, you mean just even in anyone's daily life, because you are interacting with people, because you are living in a community, there's always a way for you to join them and, and voice your opinion and voice what you think is right or wrong and what are the things that we need to change. Yeah, it's, again, there, there are existing structures in place, but I oftentimes will find myself find myself in the conversation, whether it be even something as basic as a neighborhood association or uh, joining a meeting, I'll find or that, or there's a town hall, I'll find that there are very few Asian facade on their faces, or even at the March for our, our Lives on firearm safety of high school students demanding justice and ensuring that we remove firearms from schools, or when that is going to a women's march during the month of March for Women's History Month, uh, we don't see as many Asian facade on their faces. So it's important that we go out and we march. And also I've heard this argument that Asian Pacific Islanders were sort of apathetic and we just don't like to get involved in politics and we just like to keep to ourselves. But if there's any example, uh, look at what's going on in Hong Kong and what you've seen weeks, months long ends of protests on the streets of multi-generations, not just the young people, but people throughout all the different generations. And you've seen some other places in Taiwan and others. So it, it, it is such that it's, it's our obligation to be an active citizen. And I think that's what's really important, Vincent, which is how do we define ourselves as Asian Pacific Islanders and as active citizens in the United States? Definitely, definitely, thank you. Uh, just, a reminder, just a reminder to our audience, uh, if you guys have any questions, just please throw in the chat box. Uh, I can ask them to, to uh, Mr. Lowe here, and I hope he will uh, give us answer just as detailed as the last one. So uh, another question that I hope you'd like to answer. Uh, what has been the most fulfilling moment in your work so far? Uh, most fulfilling is um, uh, helping people. Um, I'll say that a part of the role is that of government. And uh, just one story to which I mean, we're dealing with the fires right now, but uh, there were fires um, quite some time ago. I think it was maybe almost about three years ago. Um, over in North Cal Northern California in Santa Rosa, to which uh, a number of constituents had family members who had their homes burned down and uh, their insurance companies would not honor uh, their, their claims. And so we had to ensure that we are holding corporations accountable to ensure that they are helping people. And at the end of the day, we were successful in being able to do so uh, and helping people in their time of need. Or even right now, when there's a power shutoff, and there's no electricity and it's terrible air quality and yet the shelter in place we are helping people in real time ensure that we have the institutions working for them because this is a time at which people need us the most and we need to be for them be here for them uh, we are their safety net and it's again our obligation to be able to do so mm, thank you thank you uh yeah I, de I definitely sympathize with that uh the there's a deep feeling of uh of, of happiness you get when you know that you see someone else happy because of the work you did. Not, not because I guess like, oh, he feels happy, I feel happy, but you, you definitely feel that I, I, this, this person, their life is better now and I played a role in that. And that can be the same for everyone else too. So I definitely understand what you mean. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, another question that I, I can see uh, asked from the audience is, uh, what is the difference for you uh, between mobilizing on a national level like you did with the Yang Gang uh, and on a state or local level like you do for your own campaigns? Uh, it's a whole different ball game uh, on, the, on the national stage, uh, which again, it's utilizing the infrastructures that's in place. It's very different than if you are running a national campaign in which you have 50 states and you have to check in with the different state party chairs or the different organizations, whether it be the local chapters or the statewide chapters of Planned Parenthood or whatever the, or the NAACP, whatever the organization might be. Whereas at the local level, you have one to go to and you sort of know that community very well. And there's a history. Whereas on the national stage, uh, most people do not have the type of exposure and the long listing relationship that might exist, uh, that would exist at the, at the local level. So it's very different and the, the resources are very important. And because you're competing with so many other high powered folks, uh, who might have more resources or might have greater longevity, uh, we are oftentimes at a disadvantage. And I also think that's an important characteristic to make, which is for our community, uh, we still have a long way to go, but I'm hopeful with this generation of those that are on this call, that in my lifetime, we will see a future president of the United States with 
the background consisting from that of the roots of the Asian Pacific Islander community. And we see that currently, uh, but there will always be barriers for the first. And so I'm hopeful that we can recognize that and also encourage us to support where possible. Thank you. And between local and national levels, do you think that it's harder to, uh, to connect with those communities that might have not seen before as opposed to the ones that you've been living around? Oh yeah, that, I mean, this just goes by, by example. People will be naturally incredulous and question who you really are uh, because they haven't seen what you've done for us back at home, whereas there's a track record of you back at home. So it is very oftentimes much more difficult uh, to uh, find validators on your character and on your passions and on what you've been able to accomplish and achieve, which goes back to the, that notion again. For us, we aren't part of, we generally aren't part of the old boys network, whereas there are long family dynasties that have been around in American politics and in government for a long period of time, oil tycoons, uh, long-term families. So we still have a long way to go, but we, uh, we, we, we are making a point in our own uh, current uh, Democratic vice presidential nominee. Hmm, thank you. Uh, and speaking on, I guess, the, the foundations of, of getting these roots into our communities about people who are already attached to politics, uh, from, from Janice Peng in our chat, uh, she asks, uh, what would you say to an Asian Pacific Islander American student who is thinking about going into politics, but isn't sure that if they would succeed? <laughs> uh, I'd say follow your heart. Follow your heart and follow your passion. Uh, when I first got involved in politics, I ran when I was 21 years old and I lost the first time. And why that is so important too is um, I abide by the sort of the Asian culture and in the Chinese culture in particular, we care about saving face, about a sense of pride, putting our best face forward. We don't talk about the problems with our families, our financial issues, health problems, whatever the issue might be, everything's wonderful. And so to have a public failure, um, is hurt but you also learn to pick yourself up again and then you learn from adversity adversity builds character and you learn from your mistakes and you try again and you can build off of that foundation so i encourage you to follow that passion and do not be afraid uh, do not be afraid to uh, to challenge yourself because if you let fear conquer and take over you on a wide variety of, uh, of decisions then it'll impede your ability to fully blossom into the person that you really are. Thank you. Uh, that's interesting. You you lost the first time you you ran for the election, uh, but like, was it close? What made you think that the second time around that you were going to win it this time? Yeah, Vincent. You know, when I ran, uh, this was back in two thousand and four, and I was the first person of color to run for the for the office. And I had people actually say to me, uh, "Wow, you speak English so good." Uh, because they, I'm seen as somehow a perpetual foreigner uh, and or that I'm not truly American or that I had to prove my loyalty. Uh, but yet I'm fourth generation Californian speaking more Spanish than I do Chinese. So when we think about our, our role and our obligation, I in turn turn that as a potential weakness to say, no, this is not, this is, this is important for us to, to talk about and that I can prov do just as good as anyone else. But it's a shame that I had to prove my patriotism or how uh, American I truly was, but this is the realities that were dealt with. And by the way, you know, we not, that's just not just on someone like myself, but we see it all across the spectrum for so many of us. Andrew Yang certainly uh, uh, saw that at the national level when he was campaigning in states that had less than one or two percent Asian percent of the population. Uh, so this is this is real. But that's why again, this organization is so important for us to have dialogue and ensure that we are at the table. I understand, thank you. So, so to you, you're not just running for yourself because you believe you need to do a good job, but also because there are people like you uh, from your background who aren't represented and need to have their voice heard too. Yeah, honestly, Vince, I, I, I was angry. Uh, I was angry because I didn't see anyone who looked like me. And in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, the population consists of close to 40% Asian Pacific Islander. Again, why that's so important. Silicon Valley, the majority of the population in this county consists of Asian Pacific Islanders. That's the largest demographic, largest group, ethnic group uh, of any, uh, more than Caucasian. And so therein lies the obligation that we should ask that fundamental question. 
do we then have adequate representation in the public sector, within our school districts, superintendents, principals, teachers, police officers, firefighters, and also in government? But then also, do we see Asian Pacific Islanders in the C-suites, the CEOs, CFOs, uh, COOs? Do we see high levels of Asian Americans in the, the technology sectors? These are the things that I think are very important, and that's what we're demanding. Interesting. But even, even if you have a, uh, like someone run for office and they, may, they might not be of the same like ethnic background as you, do you feel that you, we still need to have someone in the same background as us in office, even if someone else who's not in the same background might still sympathize with us? Yeah, I think there are a number of factors. And I think you, you acknowledge a, a, a very important uh, question, which is that of uh, representation versus that of empty tokenism. In other words, just to support someone or ensure that we elevate someone just based on uh, their ethnic background, I, I don't think is something that we're looking for. What we're saying is diversity and representation matter, number one. So let's acknowledge that. At the same token, we also want to make sure that they are qualified and that they support the policy issues. So there might be a fundamental policy disagreement on many of these issues, uh, whether or not you're Democrat, Republican, whatever the issue might be. But nonetheless, I think we can all agree that we are better served when we have a diverse represent representation, we see diverse representation in government in all sectors and facets of American life. Mm, thank you, thank you. Uh, from Grace Zhang in our chat, uh, she asked, uh, how, how did you kickstart your political career? Like what made you get started on it? How did you know when you were 20, 21 that yeah, I'm, I'm gonna run for, for mayor or I'm gonna run for city council? Uh, I didn't know. Uh, as I mentioned, I was not on the path of politics, but it wasn't until I, first, I took my first class in Asian American studies, in which I was so, again, as I told you, I was angry. And I got angry because uh, I first took my Asian American studies class uh, when I was about 20 years old in community college. And I said to myself, why did I not learn about my own American history? Asian American studies, we were talking about Asian and American history, which is American history, it's California history. And I was so frustrated that I did not learn about this in public, my public education. And so I said, well, I, I feel empowered. I know about my history. And then, then it provides context as to why should Asian Americans care about the Muslim ban that we see today? And because some people say, well, we're not Muslim, so why should we care? Well, did you know that this also happened to those in the Asian Pacific Islander community in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which forbid migration from a geographic region to the United States, and or the California Alien Land Law of 1913, which prevented Asian Pacific Islanders from owning property. Once you know about your history, you'll see it, this being re the re history repeats itself. And we will oftentimes say that this is unacceptable towards someone. And that's why, again, the allyship is so important for us then to support Black Lives Matter, to support those that are undocumented, to support those and that are fighting for equal justice. Um, because this is about American society and we need to make sure that our voices are adequately represented. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, as much as we are Asian, we are also Asian American. We have to consider that there are others around us who will be going through the same things too and be better for them than others were for us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Vincent, I mean, when you see that we are being subjected to uh, um, being accused of being uh, spies uh, because of uh, the occupant in the White House talking about, oh, we're spies or the Kung flu virus uh, and the hatred, the hatred and racism towards Asian Pacific Islanders. We see the same type of racism and discrimination in areas of criminal justice uh, and in public safety towards our brown and black brothers and sisters. So it's important that we speak out and we call racism what we see it, whether not it's to us or any other community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's one point, remember, you brought up during your speech very briefly. You said that uh, there's this view that a lot of Asians are apathetic towards politics, but you brought up the example about Hong Kong. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the same case in the U.S., at least very overtly to us, uh, but especially among the youth, because I know a lot of people around my age and who are Asian American, and they seem not to care. They, they seem to just like want, like you said, worry about their college, they worry about their employment, but they seem so apathetic about politics around them and why in Hong Kong it, it worked out because it does affect them directly. So how do you think we can get uh, Asian youth to care about uh, current issues uh, and get them out to vote, especially in local elections? Oh, this is a question from Stephanie Hu, by the way. 
Well, this is a good question, Stephanie. I mean, your guess is as good as anyone else's. If I had the answer, I think we'd be in a much better place into which we'd have a uh, an Asia Pacific American uh, a a a API in the White House already. But um, I think representation matters. And I'll say that at least for me, I can talk from my experience. Uh, I didn't necessarily have or see on the mainstream Asian American role models or leaders growing up. And I'm a different generation. I'm still millennial, but I grew up in a different generation to which growing up as a child, I didn't have the internet. And when I asked myself, who would I think about as an Asian American hero? I didn't have a wide variety of NBA players like Jeremy Lin or actors like, uh, like those in Crazy Rich Asians or a number of uh, elected officials, senators, mayors. But now that's changed. And so I'm hopeful that the next generation can also say, I too can become the next uh, all-star or the next pro football player or the next mayor or governor or whatever the issue might be or the next CEO of a big corp major corporation. And this takes time, but I think it's important that we ask ourselves again, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, what am I doing in my life every day to be interconnected with everyone else and helping? Sometimes it might also be a sacrifice of ourselves. You know, sometimes it might be at our own self-interest, but we know that it's helping the greater good. We just have to keep asking ourselves that question. Mm, thank you. And that's why we have people like you to look up to, to see like, oh, there are Asian Americans in politics. There are people that we can strive to be like. Uh, one other question we have here, is, uh, is how has your campaign work affected the way you understand people in politics? Because I imagine that like, like growing up, you interact with friends and family, get to know them well. Uh, but once you start to interact with people on a more, uh, like on a basis for, for, for politics, for trying to mobilize a campaign, how has that affected the way you view them? Well, I think it helps keep you grounded. And I think that's critical. Uh, I think uh, being able to talk to people the real average everyday person is really important because it keeps you grounded. You'll talk to people who disagree with you vehemently. You'll have people who don't trust you and you get a sense as to where this is coming from. You'll get people that uh, give you great accolades, but it's a, a really important that you have a wide variety of being connected with people so that you are not just in your own silo, that you don't just read what's on Twitter or on social media, but you get outside of your own scope and frame of mind so that you can be in touch with the realities that exist. And I think that is the most, that is a very challenging part of the job, which is to make sure that you stay grounded with the truth, grounded to the core and being reminded as to the calls of public service and what this is really about, not to get caught up in the hyper politicized world of hyper partisanship, but making sure that you remember your roots and where you came from. And that's why I always talk about my personal experiences that I talk about my personal experiences, being a millennial, being young, not being able to afford to live in my own community, that I, living in Silicon Valley, cannot afford a single family home in my community because one needs to earn close to $270,000 to afford a single family home in my community. So I know about the struggles of younger people because I'm living it day in and day out. And that's why I'm gonna prioritize affordable housing in the state so that we can provide the access to the California American dream, just like everyone should have. And th that is what we need to maintain our heart, maintain our core, our compassion and our empathy. Mm, thank you, thank you. Okay, this question is a little bit longer and I hope I don't mispronounce your name, from uh, Saini Hua. She says, as a Tongan woman born and raised in the Bay Area, sometimes I find Pacific Islanders, so Polynesians, uh, Melanesia, Micronesians, excluded from conversations about civic engagement in API spaces. Uh, I have heard the same sentiments from some of my Southeast Asian students about underrepresentation. Uh, what are your thoughts about addressing the diverse needs of the entire API community as a collective and individually? Yeah, it's, it's an important one and a very valid one. I hear you. I agree with you uh, loud and clear. And that's why it's important that we look at the policies to change the policies so that we can ensure that the resources go into the respective community. So case in point. Whether or not it's government surveys or questionnaires, census, or then demographic data. When you see check the box, oftentimes when we fill out a government form, it might say white or it says Caucasian, might say African American, Latino, Hispanic, other, uh, or, or, or Chinese, or Korean, or Asian Pacific Islander. And sometimes people have a difficulty, people have difficulty in trying to figure out where they go. And that's why we have advocated in the state legislature disaggregated data so that when you see the demographic, 
the, within institutions of higher education. When you look at, for example, representation in the University of California and UC Berkeley, UCLA, then it says we have the majority of student populations consist of Asian Pacific Islanders. Well, that's not telling the true story. We might see greater representation from Chinese, Korean, and Japanese, but if we don't disaggregate the data, we won't know about the Tongan, Samoans, uh, Chamorros, we won't know about Loatians, about all the other communities and what distinctions there might be, or even in the criminal justice system. And you say, oh, Asian Pacific Islanders make up a small percentage within our jails and our prisons. When you look at the consistency, okay, why is there that we might see greater representation of Vietnamese, Cambodian, Thai than that of, let's say, Korean, Japanese, or Chinese? So these are the policies that we need to change so that we can have government see people for who they are and not just put us all in one lump boat to say, oh, we are the modern minority and we don't need any help and that we all excel. That's not the case. That's why we, it's important that you ask that question and that we hold our elected representatives accountable to ask that question. What are you doing to support disaggregated data so that we have the identification all across the board of the specific community needs that exist? Thank you. Uh, what do you think is the best way to do that on a community level? Because I imagine that like, when we create these organizations, like we have like CLUSA, that are imagined mostly for the Asian American population, but you have you have that voice dominated by, like you said, like by, by Chinese, Japanese, Korean voices. Uh, but do you, does that mean that you have to create even smaller organizations that are filled with the Pacific Islander voice? Or how do we make their voice heard uh, as proportionally loud as to the rest of the voices in the crowd when you have such, such an organization? Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's, there's a wide variety of different approaches. One is to make sure that there is an organization that can also participate with a wider or, uh, coalition or federation. Uh, there are a number of Asian Pacific Islander groups that work in the social justice space. And then they also come together with coalitions and, uh, of a federation where there are represent, representatives from all these different organizations that advocate on a wide variety of, of different areas. And it's also important to note that we, the, the terminology, by the way, of Asian Pacific Islander or Asian Americans was such that of political representation. It was to ensure that we are stronger together within American society so that we are recognized as a whole. Uh, but because we've also found that you can easily splinter us off and have us fight against each other. So we came together. That was a terminology used to build greater political representation. But we also need to be real with the, the, the realities that exist on recognizing the distinctions and the different needs from our community. So again, being involved with your own organization is also is one way, but then also to uh, join existing organizations and making sure that you continually ask that question uh, whether or not be on the board of directors or otherwise. I see. Thank you. Uh, here's a more general question I think that will apply to your career. Uh, what has surprised you most as an assembly member uh, being representative of your community? Surprising the most I think is uh, it's something I struggle with uh, which is that of feeling like I'm representing my community uh, to the best extent possible. And sometimes I, I feel that it can be, there can be necessary conflict, uh, whether or not it's the issue, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that of affordable housing, uh, in which there are some within my community that might be on a, in Silicon Valley, might be on a different socioeconomic bracket, and they have the wherewithal to support themselves as single family homes in large lots. And so they might be opposed to condo units or, a, uh, apartments or additional uh, high rises or any type of housing developments. So there lies sort of the conflict to which I, I attempt to represent the community as best as possible, but sometimes there can be unique conflict. And that just goes back to saying, not all Chinese think the same, right? I'm, I'm Amer ABC, American born Chinese. So I might think differently than that of someone who recently immigrated here or someone from Hong Kong might think differently from someone from Beijing or someone from Taiwan thinks completely different. And that's just within the respective community of that of being Chinese. And that's very different than of other communities with that we referenced earlier in the Asia Pacific Islander lens. I see, thank you. Uh, but on the topic of people who disagree, do you think that they're, oh, let me, let me profess this, but uh, I guess are competing, competing schools of thought on when they elect someone, when you elect someone, do you, do you want them to be just a mouthpiece for the majority opinion in your community? Or do they elect someone who they think 
will best represent what is what their values like what will be the, the best for them as a whole so th these two approaches can be different in a way which one do you think applies better to you yeah thanks for you know i, I i'm glad you brought that up because i oftentimes talk about this to groups uh, i taught american government at the anza community college so i often talked about this uh, and there's two distinct key types of representatives one is uh, a trustee and a, or that of a delegate there's two so a trustee uh, you essentially elect them you know their character um, but you elect them because you know based on their character their morals that you have a sense that they're going to do the best based on their judgments but it also means that they're not always going to vote your way every single time but you know that for the most part they're going to do the best to the, their abilities and you trust them you have a sense they have a sense of integrity uh, versus that of a delegate do you want your elected representative to be a delegate? In other words, you want them to vote exactly how you want them to vote. And if they don't vote how you want them to vote, then you want to kick them out. So the delegate in that role views themselves as voting their district, voting their community. What does the majority of their constituency think? And that's how they'll vote. Versus a trustee, they will factor in that of what their constituency thinks, but they'll also base their decision making on other factors, including that of what might be a in the best interest of all of California versus just your own district. And I'll say to you, you asked the question, who do I see myself most as? I'd say most of the time I see myself more as the trustee, which is uh, the community knows who I am. I was born and raised in my community and I'm gonna do the best to my abilities. But it also means that I won't vote their way every single time, but I at least will have an explanation and explain to them why I chose a different direction they may disagree, but finally, at least I explained to them why I disagree. And this is, by the way, no different from my own, own very own mother. Uh, my mom and I disagree on a number of different issues, and yet we still go home and uh, have dinner together, and we still love each other. And that's how I think and I hope politics and government should be, which is you will fiercely in a democratic society have debates, passionate debates about a policy issue. You'll have your disagreements, but you do not need to demonize each other because you know that you're all in it for the best reasons made possible. Thank you. Uh, we have only have a few minutes left, so I only have one more question to ask you. So this is from Sandra Penn. Uh, she asks, how do we activate the uh, Asian American voice in battleground states or areas uh, to, en to energize and empower them where there are only a few of them there? Yeah, I think that's very important. There are a number of organizations uh, that, that exists to which you can do letter writing campaigns or GOTV, get out the vote specifically to ensure that Asian Voice Islanders are the margin of victory. And by the way, just side note, that is the case. In places like Virginia, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Asian Voice Islanders are the margin of victory. So they are the, 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 we are large enough to help sway an election one way or another. But it's important that there is a platform that Asian and Pacific Islanders know that there's a reason why they should get involved and that they have a sense of urgency as to why they get involved. And that's again, why I hope that there are more elected representatives who speak our issues so that they can see, yes, I wanna participate because there's someone that looks like me and I trust them and I believe in them because right now politics is seen as a dirty word, it's divisive and it's just made for those uh, the highest economic bracket and they're all corporatists. But rather this is about holding our democracy accountable but what's required is that we are engaged and involved. Thank you, thank you. What, what great words to end, uh, end this presentation by. Uh, th thank you so much for, for coming today to share your thoughts with us. I hope everyone else in the audience uh, learned something valuable about what it means to mobilize a community. So now we'll be moving on to our breakout room sessions where you'll be able to ask questions to a pair of panelists. Uh, I will show our directions here. Uh, so, uh, the format will have two different breakout, uh, four different breakout rooms uh, and two rounds of them, about eight, 20 minutes each, in which you see a different pair of panelists in each section. Uh, and so now I would like for each of them, our panelists, to briefly introduce themselves. So if Brandon could start, let me go in order. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here today. I'm Brandon. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, specifically the East Bay Area. Um, and um, I guess like my background is I um, was involved a little bit on a political campaign for the assembly district in that area. And then um, now as a college student, um, I've continued kind of 
um, doing a little bit of organizing work like my on my college campus and um, worked for a nonprofit called Lambda Legal, which is um, an LGBTQ civil rights nonprofit. Um, but yeah, and like uh, hope to go to law school eventually. And Julie? Hi everyone, my name is Julie. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I am the program's associate and designer at Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote, API Vote for short. We're based here in DC. I'm originally from Ohio, so team Midwest. Um, I work with students across the nation, um, both collegiate students as well as high school students. I don't know how many people here are involved with um, API organizations on their own campuses back home, but if you are, there's a good chance that I am working with the leaders of those campuses and we are working to implement voter registration, voter engagement and census education on each campus so that folks can, um, we can really get the youth vote out this election day. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Julie. And now for Vidya. Hi everyone, my name is Vidya. Um, I'm a senior right now in high school and I use she, her, hers pronouns. I have been organizing in my community um, in the suburbs of Houston for about four years now. I started off originally doing um, lobbying at DC and on a really, really small school board campaign. And then from there, I kind of moved forward. Um, if you're a high school student right now, you know that the last couple of years have been kind of crazy. So my organizing path has followed that a little bit. I've done, I've done gun violence prevention, um, electoral work in 2018 and now 2020, and I also do work um, on climate-related issues, and I'm really happy to be speaking to all of y'all here today. Thank you. And now for Moody. Hello. Uh, my name is Moody Madhipatla. I'm a technology executive over the last two decades. Uh, I'm located in Cupertino, headquarters of Apple, and uh, Last four years now, I've been actively involved in community, in mobilizing community on various local issues. And uh, so I'm now technology executive and, uh, and a community activist. I carry two titles. I'm looking forward to talking to you all today. Thanks. Thank you, Mooney. And now for Brian. Hey, everyone. My name is Brian Davidson. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I created a movement called Whisper. And we're trying to solve loneliness and social isolation on high school campuses through genuine connection and better conversations. We've seen students rise up to do incredible things in their high school to solve what's one of the greatest problems that we have today, especially at now with the pandemic. This, to me, it's the second pandemic is uh, mental health. So just going after that and putting a platform in the hands of students so they can transform the climate of their campus. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's Jorge here. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Jorge Pacheco Jr. I'm, um, I'm, an, uh, I'm the Vice President for the Oak Grove School District in San Jose, California, and a Director and Incoming President for the California Latino School Boards Association, a, a statewide organization representing school board leaders um, for Latinos um, all across the state of California. And I'm really excited to be here. And I'm also part of the API community. I'm um, indigenous Maya, Salvadoran, and Korean. And um, the first, and the first uh, Latino elected to my school board and the second Asian. I'm the youngest person. I just turned 30 this year. I ran when I was 27. So I'm excited to talk about how we can mobilize the youth for politics. Thanks. Thank you, Jorge. And for Ramin. Hi guys, I'm Ramian. Uh, I'm from the Dallas area. I'm a senior at the University of Texas at Dallas. And I've had quite a handful of doing community organizing experiences. Uh, my recent one was over the summer. I did organizing for an art call nationwide for Muslim advocates and Shangri-La Law's um, American Muslim Futures exhibit. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. And finally for Nicole. Hi everybody, I'm Nicole Reddick. I use she, her pronouns and I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a junior at Bucknell, but here I'm talking about how I'm a campaign field organizer for rural Pennsylvania. I'm currently on my fifth race right now, which is a st state Senate race. Um, and I really work on races with underdogs who are running against, you know, 20 year incumbents in areas that have really been politically left behind. So I'm working to organize communities to build accountability back in politics and um, to really build trust that hasn't been there for a long time. Thank you. And now we will briefly introduce us moderators. So for Alicia to start. 
Hi, my name is Alicia. Um, I'll be moderating room number one. Thank you all for being here. I'll be mostly faceless, so uh, doesn't exactly matter what my background is, but roughly po politics. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Now, Dylan. Everyone, I'm Dylan. I'll also be one of the moderators. I'll be doing the same task as Alicia, so no worries about what, what my background is. I'm happy to hear you guys and uh, happy to facilitate all this conversation. And I'll see you in the breakout room soon. And for Nikita. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nikita. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for breakout room three. Um, and I'm super excited to, to talk to you guys. Perfect. Thank you. And then there's me. I'm the last moderator. You guys have heard my voice all day today. So I'm sure you guys know me enough. I'm the last moderator. And now we'll be breaking out into the rooms. So I'll see you all in a bit. What you guys have been doing, or reintroduce yourselves because the audience might have uh, forgotten a little bit uh, in the last few minutes. Sure, so I'll go first. So, sure. uh, my name is Muni Madhipatla, just call me Muni, that's much easier. Uh, I'm a technology executive for the last two decades and a community activist for the last four years. I do both, and uh, I live in Cupertino, Northern California, where Apple is headquartered. So, thank you. Okay. And I'm Ramian. Uh, I'm a senior at the, uh, in the Dallas area studying American Studies. Um, and I've done a handful of different community organizing projects um, in my area. Colin Allred ran for Congress, so I was there for his first run for Congress. I was one of his fellows, uh, and I did community organizing, um, specifically focusing on Muslim communities and Asian American communities. Uh, I've done community organizing on my campus. And I, and just most recently, I did an internship with Muslim Advocates, and we were community organizing for a call for art for a digital museum exhibit coming out later this month with Shane Gray Law. It's called American Muslim Futures. Thank you, Ramin. And so before I forget, I just want to remind the audience here, uh, please turn on your microphones and your cameras, because unlike for the last session where you had a lot of people, uh, we have a smaller session here. So if you'd like to ask, a question or participate, please do. Uh, you can also throw questions to the chat box, but I'd like to see some participation from most people here to get engaged and ask these panelists their questions. I, I'm, I'm sure they're not scary, they won't bite. Uh, please, uh, if, you have, if you're curious on any matter, just please um, shout out any, any questions or comments. So uh, to start off, I guess one question i like to ask you guys is, uh, what strategies have you found to be useful in community mobilizations? Like what specific tactics do you think is a good trick to get people to start uh, acting on it? Um, I'll go first. I think for both digital organizing, like doing it online and in person, the first thing I like to do is actually reach out to a member of the community, maybe like a community leader. Like, you know, for me, if I was doing voter registration for Asian Americans, I'd go hit up my local Apapa, Apapa chapter and ask them like, hey, what is one, uh, what's a great way to reach uh, people for them to register to vote or voters in general for an upcoming election? Um, so that's what I would like to do. Thank you. Yeah, so, so for me, um, so, so I'm, I'm mostly involved in you know local issues, right? So I don't get involved in the national ones. And uh, first, you know, you got to show you know you're passionate about you know what you're doing, right? So once people see that you know um, how much passion you carry and you know why you are in it, and then they people people usually you know rally behind you, right? So so they and and, and the fact that you know you are taking time to go and talk to them and explain to them you know what the issues are, and you know and explain it in a way that you know, they can relate to, uh, translating you know, a complex problem to something that you know, they can understand and relate to, um, that's the key. Right? So, and, and that always worked for me. Mm. Thank you. Uh, for one, one, one question I was thinking about asking is, uh, both of you, I assume, are from an uh, American Indian background, is that right? I'm actually Pakistani as well. Pakistani, okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to jump to conclusion. No, it's okay. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I, what I was curious about is 
because you guys have what I assume to be like minority ethnic voices uh, in your communities, which are dominated by like other races, uh, how, what is the best way you think to make your, your, your voices heard in that way? Like in the, like with everyone else shouting like what they want, uh, how do you guys make your voices heard too, to make everyone understand that, hey, we, we, have, we have a say too in this? Uh, okay. uh, oh, go first. So yeah, so for me, you know, um, it doesn't matter, you know, what ethnic group or you know, race or, um, you know, whatever the color of the skin. It's, I think, you know, the issues are the same. Uh, you know, I always approach it with, you know, we are all humans first, right? So, and, and so, um, so from that point of view, you know, I have very good, first, you know, when I saw these issues and I saw, you know, my own community that, you know, the South Asian community were not that involved. And so my first order of business is, you know, to get them, you know, organized and come around and, you know, become a voice. So I started a group, you know, for that and, you know, and, and kind of, you know, showed them, you know, you can have a voice and you can control the outcome. So first and foremost is, you know, hey, get engaged, you know, stop sitting on the sidelines and complaining about the outcome rather than you know, get involved and, you know, change the outcome. So, so that's, you know, the first order of business. So once I got them riled up and, you know, worked with me on that, then, you know, I started working with, you know, establishing, you know, relationships with various other groups and, and kind of, you know, look at finding a common ground, right? The issues that affect, you know, Indians, you know, Chinese or, you know, or Caucasians, they're all the same issues, right? So, so long as, you know, you can find that common theme and establish, you know, working relationship with the various groups and get your own group, you know, uh, step up, you know, that's key for success. And, and that's how I've done it here. Thank you. But do you feel like you, I remember you, you, sp you spoke before to me about um, when, when you were, when you were talking about issues, it was mostly for like, like one or two issues, but what happens when you think about uh, like longer issues or things that you might not be able to solve right away do you think that it's easy for people to to forget about their problems and then kind of stop caring because of that or do you think if you can engage people enough they will keep they will keep talking about it they'll they'll keep it in mind whenever they're making these decisions yeah i i think you know um so so if you can find so first of all you know coming from my background right you know um asian community right the priorities are you know as Evan Lowe said as well, right, for the vast majority of us, the top priorities are, you know, family, work, and kids' education, right? So, so nobody is going to compromise any one of those, you know, for getting civic engagement into, you know, one of those top three priorities, right? So, so first is, you know, get them to understand, you know, civic engagement is important as well, right? So it's not, you know, the top three priorities, but somewhere in the list. So then when you get the group along those lines, you're going to find some people that are you not know, passionate, right? So then you need to create, you know, basically, you know, I approach it in a three-tiered model, right? So I have a core group that discusses, you know, strategy and, you know, how to go about, you know, uh, pursuing an issue and all that. And then there is, you know, volunteer group that are willing to spare some time, you know, for that cause. And then there is, you know, general support group. So you need to create, you know, that kind of structure where, you can engage them at different levels, right? So, and, and they, and, and then you can keep them, you know, engaged on a longer term because you know, one of, this is not like, you know, one and done deal. You got to, you know, um, start from ground. Like right? for example, our focus was you not know, to elect, you know, resident focused, you know, city council and mayor, right? We started that in 2016 and we made, you know, great inroads where you know, right now, you know, we have four council members that are more resident focused and less likely to be influenced by big money, right? In this election, we will make it, you know, all five resident focused, right? But then we have, we also have to create a pipeline of candidates to fill that roles, right? So that means, you know, we started filling, you know, various commission positions, you know, with like-minded people that are focused on the community so that we are, we are creating a great pipeline. So, so the thing that we started in Cupertino, I don't expect it, you know, to end anytime soon. It's going to last long because we created a scalable model that, you know, and with a good pipeline of people, you know, working through the chain. Thank you. 
actually, Muni, um, I really like the point you were talking about, really in reference to Vincent's question about, you know, um, how do we make our voices heard when we have such like a big community? You know, I definitely do agree intersectionality is very important. And I think it's kind of like what you said earlier was uh, kind of like with strategies. It's like, how do we get people to listen to what we want? One thing I like to do is one, just talk to the people, um, you know, that I want to organize with. So let's say uh, I'm also Muslim. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, I think it's very important that we get different diverse groups to either come out and vote or attend city council meetings. One, we want to, I think it's really important to tell people, okay, well, this is how X city council member or this local policy is affecting your life on the daily you know, and then working from there, kind of starting to one, build that engagement, and then two, moving forward. Now that you have an engaged group that's well informed and it's passionate, and they're passionate about what they, um, you know, what they're asking for, you know, their voices will definitely be heard. And for the people who are running for office, community organizers, if they care, they're going to take the time, sit down, and listen. So, that's just, I think it's very important. But I do agree, intersectionality is very important because whatever is happening in one community, it can definitely happen in another. And discrimination in any place is just wrong. Thank you, thank you. And speaking of the discrimination, uh, I was wondering for for the two of you, uh, I imagine your communities are not going to be all, like, all exclusively uh, from the same ethnic group. Do you find that it's easier to to mobilize people who are in the same background as you? And if so, how do you get people who aren't in the same background to get on the same page too? So I'll go first, right? So uh, the first time when I got engaged, right? My goal was you know, not to rally just, you know, my ethnic group, right? I just threw myself, you know, um, into the mix, you know, as in one of the grassroots volunteers trying to do everything, right? I was blogging and, you know, I was constantly, you know, um, you know, on social media and as well as, you know, knocking on doors and walking the streets and, you know, and donating as well. So I was trying to do everything, right? As much as, you know, I could do. So then in the process, I learned a lot, right? That this was in 2016. And so I applied, you know, what, what I learned in 2018, right? So, so in 2018 elections, I tried to, you know, my goal was, you know, not to do everything that I did in 2016. Rather, you know, I wanted to create, you know, more of me. So I wanted, you know, more foot soldiers on the field, like what I was doing, you know, before, right? So, so I kind of, you know, strategized and, you know, and created. And then I looked at, you know, with, which ethnic groups are you no know, more engaged and which ones are not engaged. And, and that's when you know, I went and started, you know, a group for South Asians to kind of get them, you know, uh, involved right we were not nearly you know that much involved before but then we are now heavily involved we, i can say you know we pretty much you know control the outcome between you know the asian communities uh you know by working together between various groups thank you uh, this is q um uh, can i ask a question Sure, yeah, 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 of course, of course. Please, 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 please do, yes. So, so Q Imam, president of Papa Chapter, Houston, Texas here. Thank you so much for the panelists. Uh, the wonderful insights. I have a question. I want to just get your insight. Um, I, from my experience, and this is again anecdotal evidence, is that we find that the youth of our RP communities are a lot more issues of focus, uh, regardless of ethnic, ethnicities and what we call my age people, uh, uh, the baggage from the countries or, or, or ethnic groups that we belong to. So I see a very clear, distinct uh, sort of passion among the youth versus people who are of a little, uh, the older generation. And I was wondering if you've had any best practices, any tips to say, I found the youth to be able to mobilize communities on local issues, but I found very little success in the older generation to mobilize the communities. It seems like everybody gets pegged down on the baggage from, you know, something from the, the motherland as they call it, right? So just any ideas, any tips on how to kind of manage those type of conflicts and tips and continue to move forward? Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually take this one. So I think that's a great question. 
I do, in my experience, uh, whether it's like local elections or just like volunteer work, I do find it harder to get um, older members of the community because, you know, for them, it's like, oh, well, why does it matter for me? Or isn't it better if we just stay quiet and just play the game? And that's not always the case. Um, you know, that's, you know, and I understand where they're coming from. You know, I'm from a different generation, a different time. Um, from some of those folks. And I think the best way to convince these people is to be like, listen, like our voices are definitely being listened to. Sometimes you gotta pick and choose your battle and this is the battle that we need to pick um, and participate in. That's how I essentially frame that conversation. And I like to take a personal one-on-one -on -one approach. So even if it takes forever to get the aunties and uncles to get involved, I'm willing to take in the time. I think it's best to talk to them and see like, okay, well, what's bothering you? Why, why are we feeling this way? And, you know, talk to them to your best knowledge. Genuinely listen, don't throw out talking points they wanna hear. Be honest, be transparent. And if they wanna join, they will. Um, if they're not comfortable, that's fine. And try to see if there are other ways they can get involved. Maybe they wanna donate. Maybe they can ask five friends to come and volunteer or work with us. And that's how, and that's worked for me. Um, but that's how I usually like to do things. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so that covers most of the time we had for this uh, breakout room. So I'll, I will see you all still here, but Mooney and Ramin will be rotating to a different room. So thank you both for your, your answers. They're very, very valuable. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll see you all later. And so audience, uh, you guys, come on, participate more. <laughs> oh. th th thank you, Q, for asking the question. I'd like for the rest of the audience to be uh, as bold as you to step up and, and, and talk too. Hey, Vincent, are, are we supposed to go to some other break, breakout room at this point? Yeah, uh, I, I, I assigned you to go to a different breakout room, I believe. You still have the assignment or should I find it for you? Yeah, go ahead and assign. So I... Yeah, so you should be in breakout room two next, yes. Yeah, so is that going to automatically happen or should I do something on my end? Um, you should be... Oh, breakout. Okay, yeah, I, need, yeah. I need to choose two, you say? Yeah, choose number two, yes. Okay. So let me... The rest of you all stay here. We, we're, we're just working out some logistics. Sorry about that. Okay. Cute, you said that you are... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. So I'm, I'm based out of Houston, Texas area. So President of Papa chapter here. And one of the things that, and, and I'm going to use this time while we're switching the panelists, please mm -hmm. tell me to stop and, you know, start with a new panelist whenever you're ready. Uh, one of the things that CC Yin had brought up in one of the uh, forums in California was that we need to continue focusing and looking for the common points that bring us together. If we get stuck on the things that make us different or you know the the the, the points that we uh, don't agree on we're never going to move forward and i have found that putting the youth through the clusa internship through giving them opportunity to intern i have found that as one of the most potent uh, uh i should say instruments for us to use to bring and continue to bring oppie's agenda oppie's uh focus on putting our youth in the offices to be probably one of those points where bring, we bring everyone together. Because otherwise, when it becomes, you know, comes to economy, you get into all these partisan discussions and I'm like, no, no, no. Let's bring the focus back to civic engagement, not a party support or not a party support. So that's just my two cents. Again, we learn every day from these wonderful panelists and people who are on the ground working so hard. So thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thank, th no, thank you for sharing. Uh, no, I, I definitely agree that there, there are some obstacles in, in, in that way that uh, like the people, people like to support whoever is like on their party rather than trying to find common ground. It's this sort of, uh, I think, human instinct that they want to just be right all the time and rather try to figure out what's, uh, what's better for everyone. Um, and also it's a balancing act between, between groups because on one hand, you, uh, everyone wants to say like what's best for us all but there's different ways to approach that. So you have to kind of acknowledge the differences between groups, but also know that there is in some ways, in, in some parts, there's always going to be a better solution for everyone. So um, on, on that note, um, 
Thank you, uh, Julie and Brian are here now to have our next series of panel, panel discussions. Um, so how, how are you guys doing? Fantastic, how are you doing? Great, great. great. Uh, because uh, I'm sure uh, it's been a while since the audience heard from you guys. So could you guys both introduce yourselves very briefly? Yeah, sure, uh, I can go yeah. first. Um, my name is Julie. Hi all, um, great to be in this breakout room with you all. My name is Julie, I use she, hers pronouns. I'm the programs associate at Asian and Pacific Islander American Votes. And I work with youth across the nation, collegiate students, high school students, um, really try to engage the youth API votes. So excited to speak. Thanks, Julie. My name is Brian Davidson. I live in Atlanta and I love movements. I love mobilization. I love creating platforms for students to see what they can do to really change climate. And we created a platform called Whisper. It's not a club. It's not a program. It's not an exclusive group of people. It's a movement to transform the climate of high schools. And uh, we're seeing them really make a dent in mental health, which is, you know, a big issue today. So. Thank you. Uh, I, I know, Brian, you have a little more different background than, than Julie in terms of when it comes to this conversation. But something I'd like to start off with is uh, when you, you interact with a very diverse group of students, I imagine, do you see any, uh, any very noticeable cultural differences between them and how to approach them and also for their families about how to approach these me mental health issues? Absolutely. I mean, you see definitely differences. I mean, the diff you know, I went a couple of different high schools. If you look at two high schools, Lambert High School and Marietta High School in Atlanta, it's like two countries, completely different, right? One school is, you know, majority white, 40% Asian American. The other's like the minority white, 40% um, black, 30% Hispanic or, you know, something like that. And um, so you obviously have to tweak everything you do and address the problem that's relevant to that school. Um, because, you know, the messaging and the vision have to be relevant. Now, the one relevancy is we focus on is, and I think it's real important for mobilization or movement to just be really, really, really clear, right? And that clarity for us is solving loneliness uh, and social isolation. And on both schools, they have the same struggle. The student who is, is in, a, in a home that uh, they have to work to help their family even survive has the same problems as a student that's driving a BMW, you know, Asian American student whose mom and dad are doctors, do well, they're, they're pressured, but it's different pressures, but we're seeing students don't know what to do with those pressures. They don't know, they don't know how to handle that stress. They don't know how to handle emotions. Um, and, and so we're very logical in a lot of the culture today. We've got to learn what do we do with the emotional part of us and how do we channel those emotions in the right way. And it starts with, hey, there's a problem. And I think most of us would agree that the way we live, we've got to live more counterculture because we have systems and programs and that does not help us with our emotions. The average screen time is 11 hours a day for students. It doesn't, you don't have to be that smart. You don't have to be Democrat or Republican or independent to go, this is a problem that we've got to create some changes in our life. So we want to create opportunities for students to connect and to know how to reach out to each other and go, hey, we've got to change the way we connect on the football team or uh, FBLA or whatever it is. We've got to change it so we can change the climate of the school. It's, it's really the same except the methods tweaking a little bit along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, I'm, I'm glad you shared. And before Julie, you can respond. I have something from the audience. I think I think that they like to ask. So, uh, Priscilla, would you like to ask your question out loud? Hi. Yeah. So my name is Priscilla Martinez. I'm actually from um, Bay Area, specifically Oakland. So if any of you guys know anything about the Bay Area, especially Oakland, there's um, a huge Hispanic, African American population, and um, a lot of low income neighborhoods. And I actually do. Um, I do a mentorship program. I'm a mentor for high school kids who are at risk or basically are dropping out and if they don't have a mentor they're going to drop out and um, one thing we definitely struggle with and I like don't really know how to address is how you go into these specific communities and for these kids who who, who don't have a lot and don't have a lot of positive influences and they see you and they kind of 
don't really want to take you seriously because they're like, okay, so you come from, you know, you have money or you drive a nice car, or you, you know, you're in school, you're in college, like, why should I listen to you? Like, who are you, you know? So I don't know, you guys both seem to work with younger students. So I just kind of was wondering how you really address, like, we, we know there's an issue, we, we address the issue and we want to help. But how do you help these people who, you know, not that they don't want help, but they kind of refuse it a lot of the times. You want to go, Julie, or you want me to? Go for it. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify, Priscilla, was this a question specifically for Brian as someone who's working with um, students as like um, a, a mental health organization? Uh, just because we come from different backgrounds in terms of um, career path as well. So I just want to make sure that I'm, I would be providing you with the answer that you're looking for. I mean, I interview, I mean, I'm a college student, I'm a senior, so this is like my first time working with high school kids. I know, Brian, you mentioned that's kind of the demographic you work with, and how do you just go into yeah. that community with sometimes people who don't really want help at yeah. first? To me, this is my advice to you. My advice would be to start making change. It only takes a few people, and you need some anchor students. So you could you can find students that have a diversity, different friend groups, different clubs, different leaders. But I would go look for the one-on-one -on -one that you connect with and that you can have some kind of synergy with. And somehow you get them involved and you cast a good vision of what you really want to do. And then they say yes, you go find another student that says yes. And then you find a handful and then together you get them together and go, what can we do together? I'm a, I'm a college student senior. I want to empower you guys to make change. I'm supporting you. I got your back. It's hard for a high school student not to not want that. In fact, they don't want that. That's not a good thing, right? So I would just keep it really simple, grassroots, look for those anchor leaders. And once you get two or three students, you got a story to tell. And together you're telling a story. And your job, Priscilla, is never to make it about you, but to make it about them. You're empowering them. So you're the empowerer. Where they think you're creating, you're, you're creating change and they're doing it. You're, you're a part of doing it and really initiating it. But you want them to think they're doing it all. And then you tell the story that they're doing it all. And that story grows. Um, and it can last for years, that little bitty story. So if I was going into your high school tomorrow, that's probably something I would do is look for ways to synergize, support them, help them, encourage them, and then bring a group together and say, look what we can do. And then once you get it done, look, hey, look at the story we told. And, uh, and then you ride that story for, for as long as you can. Yeah, also just to add on and tag on, Priscilla, to your question. Um, so we actually impromptu, like spontaneously created a high school program um, this season just because there's so many high schoolers in, like looking to get involved with civic engagement. And so I think a big part of organizing, at least from our front, is to meet people where they're at. So like, what are people, what are people like passionate about? Like, what do you want to, what do they want to get involved in, right? Like, because of the pandemic, like you don't, you really lose that face-to-face -face interaction. So what kind of space can you create between your mentors um, and your program that will provide people a chance to not only get to know a mentor, but also get to know each other. So I think like, kind of bouncing off what Brian was saying, what we call that is relational organizing. Um, of course, I'm using it in the sense of voter registration. If I ask my best friend to go vote, register to vote, she'll be like, yeah, sure, you know, like, because she's not going to ghost me because that feels really bad. That's kind of rude. But like, if you're just like on Instagram and someone DMs you and you don't know this person, it's just really easy to ignore. So definitely utilizing like those relationships, those genuine relationships that you already have is, I think, really valuable. So that's a really great question. I love that, Julie. And I would add on to the serve first mentality. Find a way that when you find these students, you can truly serve them and help them. In any, any common sense in business and life, if you serve somebody first, they're going to want to be a part of uh, what you're doing. And I think another thing is look at your own life. What can you add to the value? Everybody's good at something. So I'm a kind of an activator I like to ask for big things, like to cast vision, so I ride my strengths, but I'm not as good at teaching. I'm not good at applying principles and explaining things and whatever you're good at, storytelling, teaching, creative, empowering. I think just ride your own gift uh, and that will build credibility and action with those students too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. These are really great responses. Uh, one thing I was wondering about is um, this question might apply a little differently to both of you. For so, I was wondering for those who are a little more more defeatist in your your communities or who you work with. So, for 
uh, for Brian, maybe people who seem a little harder to get out of their shell, or for Julie, those uh, those people part of the PI community who seem a little more reluctant to participate because they feel like they're so like so many overwhelming odds against them. What do you find is the best way to encourage them to feel like they're more empowered that they can overcome these obstacles? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely think speaking, there, there is a lot of like, um, as you say, like defeatists in the community, right? It's just like, um, some of it is based on values. Like, I don't want to vote because it's just one vote and then it's not really going to matter, right? Or when we talk about kind of like how Assemblymember Lowe talks, um, was asked the question about the PI communities. Like me, myself, I'm East Asian. Like I can't speak to Pacific Islander issues, let alone like, you know, South Southeast Asian issues, South Asian issues, like I'm Chinese, I can't even speak on like Korean issues, you know, like it's just, it's very different. And I think really part of the big, a really big part of it is understanding the nuance of the AANHPI community. The second part is not claiming to be an expert. So yes, we are a PIA vote. We are trying to engage all facets of our community. Um, we were, we are working with the PI com, uh, organization in uh, the University of San Diego, but um, it's really about like, I'm not trying to tell them to do anything necessarily. I'm not gonna act like an expert um, within their community. It's more that I'm someone who could just logistically tell you like, this is how you vote in California. This is why it's important to vote. Here are your deadlines. Here's how absentee work, ballot working, um, absentee um, voting works. And then the leaders of that organization takes it back to their organization and then they have those conversations. Um, I really think every school organization that we work with, they are the experts of their own communities. Um, it doesn't really seem right, it doesn't feel right, and it doesn't work for me to come into their communities and tell them like, this is how you do things, you need to do this. Um, because I think like, going back to that relational organizing piece, right? Like the ANHPI community, it's a political identity. It doesn't really encompass all of our lived experiences and cultures. And so when it comes to mobilizing different communities with sub sub communities within our larger um, ANHPI community, it really comes down to relational organizing and letting folks take reign of their own communities. I think that was awesome, Julie. I think you're right on what you're saying. And I think we call them change makers and then the leaders that can pour into, we're going to start calling them movement makers, but being anybody can be a change maker. But I have to say, some students, they say they're ready, but they're not. You got to be careful with height. You know, I'm sure it's the same way with politics or whatever you're involved in. People say they're going to get involved and you got to find out who's really means it. And, and that's when you get, you try to create opportunities for them to do it. So for me, it's like, we have a football player and I, okay, let's go bring the message of the football team. And then they're like, Whoa, I don't know about that. Right. Let's go bring it into your, into your club or bring it into the community that you're comfortable with and let me empower you and be a change maker. But not everyone's ready for that, but when they are, it changes their life because the things that you and I are trying to do, Julie, as you know, you can't learn it without doing it. You just got to do it. That's the way you, especially social issues. You can't learn. Yeah. I mean, I not doing it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think like a lot of it is learning. A lot of it is stepping back and listening, but a lot of it is lived experience. So I think like, you know, like when mobilizing community for the folks here, like feel free to like type in the chat because I love like, I don't know, I hate like zoom because you can't see people's faces. You can't like interact with people. But if anyone here is like involved with student organizing on your own campuses, right? Like we'd love to hear some of the challenges that folks are going through so that we can kind of see like, you know, what are issues that we face across the board? Yeah. And I put my email up there and you may want to do the same, Julie, just to say, hey, I'm, anything I can do to help you, encourage you, be a change maker, whatever that is. Obviously, if you're interested in seeing high schools get changed, we're here. But um, definitely just want to say, I, a lot of you are on here are, are go-getters. And I love to go with the goers and help them do more. So I'm here any way I can. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. Uh, so I'll just address one last question before we, we wrap it up here. So. Uh, I imagine that like both of you are, are are great leaders in your in for your circles. I imagine, but uh, for people who aren't in proximity to you or people who are like just audiences here, they might be looking for people like you, but in their own communities. What's the best way to find those people, or what's the best way to cultivate people who are like you guys? So. I, I can kind of talk a little bit from my lived experience. I honestly never thought my, I don't, I never thought of myself as a leader. Like back in high school, I was bullied a lot. I always just kept to myself, you know, ate lunch by myself in the art room. It was just 
you know, never thought that I would find a voice. Um, but I think I am a very passionate person. I think that goes for a lot of folks in this room as well as people in your greater communities. People care about things, right? And like, they're, you know, they're, everyone is looking for ways to get involved. I went to school at Ohio State University. Honestly, Ohio's not that diverse. My high school was like completely not diverse. Ohio State was a little bit more diverse. So as soon as I got to campus, I found the Asian American Association, you know, like I found like all these different clubs that I felt that you know, would be a more safe and comfortable space for me. And that's where I really began to boom my voice. It's like, I think the biggest thing is if um, everyone here are leaders in the, your own communities, a lot of the groundwork is just creating a space where people are comfortable, right? Like, you know, with our ambassador program, yeah, sure, it's like hosted by API Vote, but we do hangouts, you know, with, our, with my interns, we play games. Um, with my high schoolers, we do hot takes. We have a hot takes channel in our Slack where we just talk about things like, our hot dog sandwiches or do pineapple belong on pizza just like small things like that but really making people feel comfortable um and i think especially with voter and engagement you know we do like ramen and registration talking in politics so i think that comfort part is very very essential because you can't find your voice unless you're comfortable first um like you have to work through the discomfort and i would add the power of ask is learning how to you say oh i don't have people around me i don't know where to find people that are making things happen like julie I'm, I would say you just got to overcome that thought process and figure it out. Go to conferences, wherever it is, network. It can be a church. It can be a chamber of commerce. It can be a college. You can just show up at groups. I know it takes a lot to do that, but you just got to find people who will support you and believe in you and stand with you um, anywhere. And I think that's just, e even in starting a school-wide movement, the power of ask is so important. And once you do it, it changes your life because you learn. I mean, it sells in a lot of ways, but you've got to be able to go to people and ask for help. You got to be able to go to people and say, will you be a part of this and, and, and not shrink back. And um, so I think you just, you know, if you're on this call and you're that way, I'd be reaching out to Vincent here. I'd be reaching out to Julie, you know, and just go, Hey, you, and they may, Vincent may say, I'm too busy. I'm writing a book right now. Go to somebody else. Don't be discouraged. Be persistent. Just figure it out. Call, email Evan, Evan, you know, ask him, ask him for help. He may say yes, you know, so that's my two cents on that. Thank you so much for your time, both of you. Uh, I, I hope that everyone else found it very valuable too. Uh, it looks like our break rooms will be closing. So I will rejoin you all in the band room shortly. So see you in a bit. sharing my stories. Nice, nice, good. Good to hear. Say, uh, uh, Mrs. Hua, Saini Hua? Uh, I, I'm, yeah, hi. I'm, I'm just curious because I see your, your screen on mine. Uh, what campus is that in the background of your, of your thing? That is Cal State East Bay in Hayward, uh, California. Oh, okay, okay. It looks a lot like my school in, um, in Missouri. So I was, I was like, hmm, is that it? No, but interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, so I guess now we'll be moving on to our closing thoughts. So uh, even though we are approaching the end of our webinar, our panelists will remain after just a chat around uh, for up to uh, 30 minutes or so, just talk about anything they want after the webinar. Uh, and then other than that, we have a feedback survey found at this code, I believe is on the screen, is screen shared. Um, and this survey will help us determine like what we did well on this webinar, but more importantly, what we can do better. Uh, and so there are just a few more announcements from my fellow planners that they will be talking about soon. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking part in our um, in our webinar today. We've worked very hard on it and we hope these conversations have been very illuminating for for your future ventures in community mobilization, certainly, even if you don't do it politically or socially these skills and these insights will apply to many things in life. So 
when you go to the survey form, you will see that there is um, there is are some questions about potentially networking with panelists here and our former and future panelists. We would like to create a community. This community mobilization begins with the person-to-person -person interactions. And so if you are interested in connecting one-on-one -on -one with one of these panelists, please indicate so in the survey and let us know what issue areas you're interested in so that we can better match you. And Vincent, if I could have the next slide. Thank you so much. All right. so. We have one more webinar coming up. It's our fifth and final one. It's not a part of NCLF. It is in October 10th, on October 10th, um, tentatively, or almost certainly 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. if you're on the East Coast. This webinar will be about future careers in government. We often think of uh, careers in government as mainly political things, um, but there are many elected offices, or non-elected offices, that, uh, that are integral in the formation of policy and integral to our day-to-day -day lives indeed, despite that they are sometimes more invisible faces than they are the public figures. So we will have representation from local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, this uh, will range issue areas from education, like school boards or, or social justice, people who work on criminal justice reform, um, and international relations, people in the State Department. So um, geographically, we are working to get panelists from an array of the United States. I know most of the Asian American population is concentrated in California and New York, but as we've seen from our own panelists, we have people who are from indeed Milwaukee or, or Texas. So we're working towards getting a geographical representation as well. So thank you so much. I hope um, anyone who is interested in working in government will, will join us next time. Uh, and keep posted for updates. We will be sending those out via email. Hi, everyone. Um, you may have seen all these little logos in the bottom corner of these slides or in different uh, spots just hidden away. Um, YLFA. Um, young Leaders for America is currently a group of young civically engaged students, um, primarily made up of intern alumni from CLUSA, Civic Leadership United States America, and its grantee organizations, including APAPA and AAUC. Um, and we're dedicated to basically um, building up a community for Asian American uh, Pacific Islanders in the U.S. to try and um, just build leadership skills within our young uh, young. Uh, communities, because honestly, right now we're a little we're a little low on that. Um, we we do need a little bit more um, work to just get us um, leading, because oftentimes um, there there are Asian Americans are told that we're we're not to be leaders. Pacific Islands are told that they're they're not even part of the U.S. Sometimes, um, and that's that's degrading to hear. And so we need to just um, empower and build up this group of um, this this real group that exists in our country, um, people that are oftentimes underrepresented. And um, so right now we're working on building up more of a community and slowly we'll begin to um, coalesce and turn into a real 501c3 organization eventually. Thank you for your time. Look forward to seeing you on our social. Hey guys. Um, so if you can hear me, um, hopefully, um, I'm, uh, I was a moderator here today, but I'm here to talk about a little bit about my organization, Dear Asian Makita, Youth. I believe you're muted. Um, can you guys hear me now? I can hear you. Oh, I can hear apologies. You. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so basically, Dear Asian Youth is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by Asian Youth for Asian Youth. And we work to empower Asian Americans all across the world, nationally, internationally, in order to create th change through education, activism, and celebration. Um, here on the screen are a couple of our upcoming webinars. Um, our national team is consisted of 100 plus Asian youth working um, with the same goal in mind to educate and um, activate Asian youth, again, all across the world. And we also currently have over 100 chapters um, in five or plus more countries. We have so many um, different ways that, you know, um, Asian American youth can get involved um, with their communities and all. Um, our most recent, I'm sorry, our, our most upcoming webinar is actually today at four to five PST, um, business during a global pandemic. So a couple of our panelists are going to be 
um, Jason Lee, who's the founder and CEO of Jubilee, um, Hafsa Khan, who um, is an independent artist and she runs her own business, and um, Andrew Chow, who is the co-founder of Boba Guys. Um, so that's going to be a super awesome um, thing to, you know, experience and participate in. So that's today um, at on for. And we also have more of our upcoming webinars. We have one on Asian American representation in musical theater in the middle. Um, you can see some of our panelists. Um, and yeah. So I just like to give out thanks to the rest of our sponsors. They've been uh, a lot of help for putting this together. Uh, without them, we couldn't have done this, not on anywhere close to this level. Uh, and so that's about everything for the webinar. I'll bring back up this uh, end of uh, last survey so that you guys can get another glimpse at it. Uh, please fill it out if you can. And that just about sums it up. So thank you for coming and hope to see you next time. Remember the panelists will still be here for a little bit. So uh, feel free to chat with them. Thank you. All right, thank you all our panelists uh, for sticking around if you, if you have the chance. This was really wonderful. I can't speak to the other rooms, but I have to say that the conversation we had in my room was, was enormously inspiring to me. I feel really energized, which is difficult to do on a Saturday afternoon during a pandemic. Yeah, I was so touched by, uh, you know, those stories shared by the panelists. I was in uh, Alicia's room as well. It's very inspiring. So if um, we could have our remaining panelists, just let us know who, who is uh, sticking around in the chat so that we can let the participants know um, which panelists are here and we can have the participants ask any questions that they may have. Hey, I'm Brian Davidson. Good to be back. Great to see all these faces. Yeah, we'd love for you to, uh, to hear you guys um, talk. And um, I think we still have almost all our panelists in the room, as well as our moderators and organizing teams. So feel free to um, ask us any questions you might have. We're, we're all here, we're making space for you. Love to hear from you. I will start off with a question actually, because I'm so interested to hear what happened in the other um, breakout rooms. What were some big takeaways from, from the, uh, the panelists? Uh, let's, start, let's start alphabetically. I think we started with, um, well, actually I have no idea who we started with alphabetically. So Vincent, if you could take that away. <laughs> uh, I, I really enjoyed everyone's speeches. Uh, I, from our dry runs, I, I feel like I've heard some of it, but also a lot of it was new. Um, I, I think in, like some particular in, in my room with Brian and Julie, um, I forgot her name. I, I should slap myself for that. But uh, a girl, she was a high school girl. She mentioned that she, she sees that same kind of uh, um, like at-risk students in her, in her high school and that she wanted to have like some, to know more about like support items. I mean, um, like support functions that she could do for them or like what they could do for themselves. And Brian offered like a very touching uh, remark on like it's find, find others to share uh, their sentiments with them. Um, and then, and Julie also had a great add-on to that too about her experience in high school. Brian, would you mind um, repeating for us, uh, for, for the group, um, what exactly it was uh, that, you, that you offered to, to people who are interested in supporting those who might feel isolated or, or um, be, be hiding some mental health difficulties that they're facing in our high schools? So you're, are you asking what advice to those that are struggling with mental health or the other question that Vincent was referring to, to kind of help those around them? Uh, the question Vincent was referring to, how, how can okay. those who want to help or are affected by it, how can they help each other how and build a community? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I just encourage, and this is just kind of more of a blanket thing, not just for if you're needing mental health, but just to encourage anyone, um, the power of an ask and to have the courage to get help and to share vulnerably with others uh, is so vital. I mean, we teach and whisper how to have a really good conversation, you listen, but you listen to try to know the person. You listen to, 
study them. Who are they? And then as you listen to them, you respond, you respond to what you're hearing and seeing by being vulnerable back to them. Uh, and vulnerability is hard today. A lot of people struggle with being vulnerable. And then third, you act to meet each other's relational needs because starting a conversation, but leading to meeting each other's relational needs is where transformation really happens. But I was just encouraging them to, um, you know, enact the power of acting, asking, um, whether it's even on this, you know, Vincent, I use him as an example. Hey, this is a great guy. I mean, especially if you're a writer, reach out to the guy. He may be busy and say no, but it's worth asking Alicia or whoever and go to places that maybe you're not always comfortable with. Be, if you, especially if you want to be a change maker, which is what we call these students. You've got to be able to go to show up. It could be a church or a political function or a uh, you know, anything where you're just finding people and you're not afraid to ask for help. And then you're not afraid as a leader to ask people to get involved and ask people to join you. And Gen Zers tend to be a little bit, um, you know, shy with this because they want everything perfect. You know, it's the Instagram generation and there's nothing perfect about grassroots movements and getting help and all that stuff. <laughs> just do it. And it's, and obviously I know some of you are in business, like it's being a salesperson, right? You to be a salesperson. You got to go enter into their worlds. So, uh, and that's just really a lot of the heart of what I do. My business model, you know, it's not that simple, but asking is a big part of my business model. And, and, and then finding a couple people, it's only a small group. Don't get daunted with, Oh, we got to change the school. No, it starts with like two or three. And then it's maybe 10 or usually about nine to 12 train. It can, if nine to 12 can unite and change together and live this out together, it can easily infiltrate throughout the school. In fact, if you go more than that, it's almost a little too much, right? So I think it's just vital to make sure you have a crop of students who you're with and you're connected to. And, and that's not, I talked to a student recently with somebody else, one of our leaders now at Princeton, and he asked them, how many people you know in your school is a really nice private school? And he said, I know 70% of the whole school. And then Andrew Hama, the guy at Princeton said, uh, how many do you really know? And he said three. So about three people really know him. And that's a guy that's probably one of the more healthy students, right? And I think all of us could speak in that. How many people really know us and we know them? And what if you upped it? What if you doubled it? It transformed your life. And that's what I, life is about, not a business being making yeah. money and all that. Actually, Brian, I know you and I have like had a lot of conversations like in our practice room as well as in our panel together, but I just would love to speak on the idea of kind of like infiltrate, infiltrating a community and like trying to get people in. I understand that that's kind of, um, we really want to bring people into our movement and that is really um, important to us, definitely as a community organizer, right? Like I'm definitely trying to push the API vote, making sure that we get into every single community, making sure that everybody has like heard like why it's important to vote but I think the idea of um, meeting people where they're at is actually a it's a little bit better way to frame things than infiltration because that assumes that like you really want to force something on someone whereas we really want to meet people where they're at so I think in terms of community mobilization especially with communities of color like API and HPI community is so broad. We want to really make sure that we are able to kind of put out like, hey, these are the resources that we can offer you. We have experts here. Like we have people who really, really care. And the, this is like, you know, we want to make sure that you all um, understand what there is, um, why, what the importance is, as well as like, you know, if you're comfortable enough, please step into this space. And if you're not comfortable, like I think a big part of the work that we do is really knowing when to step back as well. And I agree with you. I think that's great. I think at the end of the day, what it is, is like we live in a network society and a network can get into the other networks. And, um, and I'm a connector too. So in my wiring and everybody has their strength, right? So, but I think it's just thinking strategic and saying, if you're in a certain group, can you go back and lead that group? And that's hard to do. I mean, it's not easy, but if you can, it's amazing, right? It can bring change, but I think you're right. It's just really meeting people where they're at helping them do maybe what they don't have the courage to do, but they wish they could do. And we support them and try to, you know, give them the courage to muster up, to go do, you know, you're a high school student and you're going to be done really soon. What if you did this? You know, it would really be meaningful to you. And let me help you do it. What you would never do on your own. Right. And that's what I love to do, no matter who it is. 
you so much for that. Um, I do want to touch on the other rooms as well. Dylan, did you have any insightful conversations back and forth between your panelists that you wanted to highlight? And then we can pass it on to them to maybe recreate or to, uh, to ex um, expound upon their comments. Yeah, I think we had a lot of great conversation in our room. Um, we especially had one um, pretty vocal um, attendee and I really appreciated her um, contributions to our conversation. Um, uh, regarding, I, I mean, I had four different people in my room and I think every single one of them brought something um, novel and uh, unique to the discussion. Um, I did want to touch upon uh, Vidya's, Vidya's experience herself. Um, I know she, in general, she just has a lot of experience, but as a very young individual, she's, I think she, is she our only high schooler um, panel? I believe she's our only high schooler panelist. Um, and yet she's already had four years of experience. That's four years more than me and I'm in college. So um, I do want to just like uh, shout her out and uh, boost her signal a bit and get her talking about um, her experience. So yeah, I'll video. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Um, I'm actually really interested in touching a little bit on what Julie said about meeting people where they're at and you know going into other communities. So I live in um, Texas. I live in the suburbs outside of Houston. And Asian American organizing here is not very strong in, in the areas that I live in. So the people who taught me how to organize were not Asian Americans. I learned from the Hispanic, the Latinx leaders in my community. I learned from the African American leaders in my community. They're the ones who taught me like how to run a campaign, how to, how to, you know, be an elected official, like what, how do you fight for what you want? And I think what I got from that was really a sense of going into other spaces with humility and understanding that you don't always understand other people's experiences. And that was something that was really important to me as an Asian American organizer, because you know there's so many different types of Asian Americans. And just because you are Asian American does not mean you understand the experiences of another group of Asian Americans. And that was very personal to me because I'm half Chinese and half Indian, which means I exist in part in both communities. But that also means that I don't understand certain aspects of certain communities. Even though I'm half Chinese American, that doesn't mean I understand what it means to look like a Chinese American, especially now during this pandemic when there's so, many, there's so much racism against people who outwardly look East Asian. So going into different spaces and and being there to learn even if you're an organizer even if you've done organizing for your entire life and you think you're an expert in whatever whatever you've been doing you're not an expert in everything and just going going into spaces being open and there are so many different things that you can bring back from certain communities if only you're willing to listen first before you try and add to a conversation or contribute to something. And just a little bit about like my personal experience organizing in high school. One thing that I would say that's very unique to organizing when you're in high school or you're in college is that this is the only time in your life where everything changes in four years. Everybody graduates some year. You're never going to see the same people for more than four years. And so in that, you have a very unique power structure that, that's, that's very equalizing in many high schools and many colleges because, you know, opportunities are always opening up. There are new administrations constantly like flowing in and out and you're forced to adapt to that change. And the strength that you have as a high school student is you understand how to adapt very, very quickly to change because, you know, new administration, new school year, completely new everything. And take that experience with you and apply it to other organizations. Teach other organizations that have had the same people in power for like five or 10 years, teach them what it's like to change. Because right now we live in a world where everything is changing. All of us are digitally organizing. We've never done this before, but the people who have adapted the quickest are the young people. They're us, they're high school students, they're college students, they're recent graduates. So take, take with you that element of change, that element of being open to new ideas and not shutting things down because you think you know everything. Take that humility and take that willingness to change and run with it, fly with it. And when people say that that, that idea is stupid or like, you know, you, you're too young, you don't know anything, then that might not be a great space for you to organize in and you don't have to change it. You can find another space that fits you and that's perfectly okay.
All right. Thank you, thank you oh, so sorry. much for that. Um, no, no worries, Vincent. Uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to take it away, uh, I don't no, want to uh, uh, I thought uh, you you might be on the same page as me, but uh, it looks like we want to create a a, a, sh a short um, re recording session on behalf of Julia Wu, who wants to uh, collect reasons about why we should go out and vote. Um, so if everyone could prepare just a few seconds to share like why they think it's important to vote. Uh, we'll we'll say them say them in order, I suppose. Uh, Julia, are you in this call? Oh yes. I'm um, sorry. So um, we are going to kind of create a short video that is to encourage everyone to vote. And um, so the question for everyone is why all of us need to vote. That's all. So per person, just ten seconds because we want to collect all materials and then to edit that in video and then to distribute it on our social media to do that. So can everyone just think about that um, just in 10 seconds? Just everyone just um, allowed to speak 10 seconds because we get lots of materials. So can everyone just stay and think about that and Ray, could you just help us to record those section and then send that um, recording to me oh uh, yeah sure okay so um can someone think about that and go first and we just just do the kind of record first does anyone I, know the question about that yeah uh, i i think i can start uh okay, it's important so, uh, yeah wait you want to start then or no Vincent, uh do you want to put a spotlight on you oh like, yeah yeah sure sure uh, I'll do that. Um, if the co-hosts could spotlight themselves as they speak, that'd be nice. Hi, so it looks like my face is on screen now. That's scary. Okay. Um, so it's important to vote because one, your opinion matters. And two, your, your vote is a signal to others around you that their vote is important too. So when you think about voting, it's not just about yourself, but about everyone else around you to go out there and do the same too. Yeah, thank you. How about the next one? I can go since, so uh, um, okay, wait, sorry. Should I just like click it on my screen or is someone else supposed to click it? Do you have the ability to do it yourself? Just speaker view, is that it? Or is um, it a spotlight already? Spotlight video. If you press the three dots on your screen. Yeah. Of the video. Oh, drop down you... menu. Okay. We're we uh, can we help Julie to spotlight. Oh uh, yeah. Oh oh she got. Is this okay? This is right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Asian Americans are the fastest growing pop uh, minority population in the United States. Our population is projected to grow to twelve point two million uh, voters in. 2040 and just imagine the amount of power that we have at the polls. So it's extremely important for all of us to get registered to vote and to bring all of our voices to the table. Great. How about this one? Um, I can go next. Uh, I don't, how do I do the spotlight video? Is it like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so voting is a way for you to make your voice heard in the seats of power from your local city council to the White House itself. Good. Thank you. How about this one? Are you going next? Is that okay? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So there are two equalizers on this planet. Education is one of the greatest equalizers. Voting is the next greatest equalizer. Like, it doesn't matter where the vote doesn't care, you know, whether it's in a white vote or no, or Asian vote or no black vote, every vote counts. So it's very important for every one of us to vote because your voice matters. Last city council election, a yeah, challenger won by just 40 votes in my town against an incumbent. That's why every vote counts. Go vote. Perfect, sir. So, so how about this one? Thank you.
Okay, I can go. Um, oh, sorry, Nikita, were you gonna oh. go? Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry, should... I spotlighted the wrong person. <laughs> no problem. Um, you should vote because the people in power don't want you to vote. Voting is a way to reclaim your voice against an establishment that wants to suppress your voices. And it's reclaiming the space that you deserve as another human being on our planet and in this democracy. Nice. How about next one? Thank you. Mooney, before you leave, do you want to uh, share your thoughts? My thoughts on any topic? No, uh, about voting. Uh, why is it important to vote? Yeah, I think I already did. You did? Yeah. Did I miss it? Oh, I, I must be deaf. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. You know, it's, it's a great event. Thanks for organizing it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. See you next time. So can we um so can we pass to the next one? Okay. Sorry, how do you do this? Can I just speak? Nikita? Oh, uh, yeah, I can go. Um so in order for your voice to be heard, you have to have a government body that represents you. And the people in power won't value your ideas or value your thoughts unless you're the ones, you're the person who changes that. You're the person who votes for them. You're the person who gets them in office. Those people won't value you unless you go out and find them and you also go out and vote for them. So that's why it's super important to vote. Thank you. Can we have this one? I'm going to volunteer Nicole to speak. Hi. Hi. Um, it's important to vote to express your political preferences and your policy preferences, even if your elected official or your district doesn't reflect them. You know, it lets you shine a light on what matters and how you can be a voice in the future in your advocacy. Thank you. Um, so how about this one? Anyone, anyone who wants to kind of to speak out your opinion or your answers, that would be welcome. So it's not only about the analysis, and we hope everyone can um, join the um, join the topic. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, it's important to vote because historically, um, many communities were not allowed to vote. So by us um, exercising that power and our right to power is extremely important to advance the needs of our communities. <laughs> Thank you. So how about next one? Mm -hmm. I would like to be the one, the next one. Uh, hi, this is Marcia Galanko. Um, I'm a naturalized uh, citizen uh, and I never miss uh, voting. Uh, I felt that it's a citizen duty to voice out uh, our opinions and uh, it's our power uh, and it's also a privilege. So I never miss a voting. Thank you. Yeah, you're great. So you're a good example to everyone. So everyone needs to listen to more, especially it's a really critical this year. So. We couldn't go out to vote, but there's a lot of channels you can do that instead of going out. So, just mm -hmm. vote. Thank you. How about yeah. this one? Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Can I can I just be talking? Start talking. Is that how it works? Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lin Chun from Seattle. Um, I just always um, thought that from just reading the history of our nation, it's Voting is something that our nation has worked so hard throughout history to grant that privilege to everyone. And to me, be able to vote is not only a civic duty, but it will also change um, to shape and to shape the history in the future on many levels. So will everyone go out and vote? 
Yeah, so true. Thank you. So can we have next one? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to go next if that's okay. Okay, so um, I think that it's really important to vote and then um, that I have a duty to vote because um, my immigrant parents, you know, they don't have the ability to vote. So I believe that I should be voting for them and that I should be expressing their views. Great, thank you. Um, can we have this one? Thank you. Hey, can, is, it, is it okay if I go real quick? Because I'm going to head out after this. I don't know if yeah, sure. 10 seconds. Thank you. I don't know if you're ready for me or not. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, there you go. It's important to vote uh, your conscience and to uh, guard the values of truth. And our nation needs that. And nation needs everyone to vote for what's right. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. So can we have next one? Does anyone want to talk about the topic? Just go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just like to say a few words. I just believe that um, right now our democracy is based off of the people and it's supposed to represent every single one of us. And if every single one of us votes, then we're all being represented. And it takes you to take speak out your voice and make sure that your views are represented in our democracy that's supposed to represent all of us. Okay, thank you, great. Can we have the next one? I can go next. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Fondacaro from Albany, New York. I've worked in and covered New York, or covered uh, New York state government and politics for more than three decades. If you don't vote, your voice, your opinion is not going to be represented, period. So please vote. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so true. So yeah, just as um, kind of Sandy Child just mentioned this um, morning during the kickoff um, section, that is, um, it kind of we um, together we can be stronger and together we can our future can be better or we can change the future so don't forget to vote so how about next one thank you i believe Does anyone everybody to be the next one i believe everybody has spoken um Oh, okay. So I think um I think we already kind of collect enough information yeah. and materials. So thank you everyone. I'm going to leave the panel. Thank you. Thank so uh Ray, could you just send kind of this um pieces of the recording to me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Also, yeah, whatever. thank you. Also okay, it, thank it is it is three PM here in California. And I don't want to hold up anyone any longer. So Ray, you can close the room. And for anyone who's still here, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.